Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 8th of November, December, and you are watching episode 33 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, an insight in the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, developing the North, Northern Australia, visionary or creating white elephants, is my guests, uh, are my guests, David Menzel and Jeff Haley. David Menzel moved to Kimberley from Western Victoria in 1992 with his family. He is the current president of the Shire of Wyndham East Kimberley and is an established grower in the Ord Irrigation Area, where he currently farms some 460 hectares in partnership with his wife, Karen. He has been board member of the Ord River District Cooperative since 2014, a member of the Cambridge Golf Limited since 2010, chairman of the Ord River Irrigation Cooperative since 2010, and a councillor and president of the Shire of Wyndham East Kimberley since 2017. David was also a member of the Ord, Ord, East, Ord East Kimberley expansion projects of 2008 to 2013, the community reference group and a member of the Prime Minister's Northern Australia Advisory Board in 2014. He is committed to development of the Kimberley region with an aim to maximising the positive socio-economic outcomes and enabling stronger levels of self-determination for the community. Jeff Haley arrived in Kununurra as the postmaster in 1985. Every weekend he would transfer to the Ord River and got to thinking about how magnificent the region was and how he could share it with others. Three years later, he began the first official boat cruise up the gorgeous Ord with paying customers, ogling at the beauty as much and enjoying it as much as he first did. In 1988, he left, left the security of the public service to start the tourist operation, offering cruises on Lake Argyle in the isolated Kununurra. With only 500 paying customers in the first, first years, it was a tough startup. Today, with three boats, his Triple J Tours has some 15,000 paying customers each, each season. In 2002, Jeff was the very proud recipient of the Golden Guide Award for the West Australian Peak Tourism Industry Body, FACET. Jeff was also awarded West Australia's West Australian Tourism Industry's highest honour, the David Brand Medal, in 2014. Welcome, David and Jeff. Hi, Bill. Thank you for your interest. Thanks yes, very much for good. joining me. Thank you giving up your time. If I could start with uh, you, Jeff, seeing you arrived in '88, so you got the wood on uh, David. Uh, can you tell it's us? '85 it was, Bill. '85. Oh, okay. Um, how, how did you get the job as postmaster? Was it, did you put your hand up or was it just something? No, that's, in, in those days, you had to apply for the position. So it was a pretty tough um, competition to get into the job. But um, yeah, I, I came from the second in charge of Gerald Post. I was to kind of as a postmaster or postal manager, as I refer to them now. And... <clears throat> And did you have a bit of uh, adjusting to the conditions? Oh, I think, it, bearing in mind, I was a lot younger then. <laughs> so um, <laughs> adjusting to the heat and the humidity, yeah, it's the case you either do or you don't. But, um, but I had the vision, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel and it was just a case of sticking with it. And um, yeah, I can understand now possibly why there's so many businesses go bust in that first two years of operation because yeah, it was hard. But I had youth on my side. Um, in those days, I suppose there wasn't a lot of encouragement for tourism in such an isolated place. <laughs> like these days, most people can go come up with any idea and go to the government and get a get a bit of support or or a, a grant or something. Was there anything in the, around in those days, either locally or with state government, to sort of help help you into it, or, or was it all, all you and your bank? 
No, I was very fortunate. Uh, we had a very good bank manager in town at the time, and back in those days, he, the local bank manager could make decisions of uh, loaning money to new ventures such as mine. But um, So in that regard, it's probably easier back then what it would be now to start a business. We had the local bank manager there to make the decisions. And I suppose you could always meet him down the pub and have a chat. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, he came to Kanara last year after about 30 <laughs> odd years. So I was certain to buy him a beer or three. <laughs> what, about, what about family and that? Was uh, did you drag a family up there or? Yes, yeah, so they had three daughters. Um, but one of the problems up there is education. So um, sending three daughters away to boarding school in Perth was uh, quite a financial burden. Um, but I can remember the time I sort of had a choice to I just sell up the business and go and live in Perth, get a job driving the Rottnest Ferry or something like that, to, um, or go into a huge overdraft and send the kids away to school. Okay. Okay, David, we'll move on to you and your personal um, encounters uh, and arrival into uh, Kununurra and the Kimberleys. Yeah, so we, we left Victoria, uh, being in the farming industry, left Victoria as the wool industry was struggling and back in about 91, there was a fair, a fair uh, disaster in the real estate industry in Victoria as well. So my wife was a teacher and had uh, was on maternity leave, so we had plenty of time to go and explore and we'd always um, admired the the um, opportunities that might present in the Ord and we'd, we actually met my wife's English and met her in the Pilbara on a cattle station quite a few years before she'd been to the Ord and I hadn't so it was it was an attractive place to to head off to and see what opportunities were up there so I guess, you know, nearly 30 years later, four children and, and like Jeff, you know, the hard thing up here is our kids leave home at about 12 when we send them off to boarding school. So that's, you know, that's one of the, the personal costs of, of living remotely. Um, I guess there is education a, a system here, but it, we didn't feel it was appropriate for our children and, and made the choice to send them away as well. So, yep, that was, that was a great call. Um, once that financial burden was off our hands, I guess I've been able to take a bit more off-farm uh, off, um, interests and do a few more things, community things, which is why I've got so many roles at the moment. Uh, sounds like a lot of roles, but it's really only one role, and that's about um, development of the north, and it all fits together pretty well there. Everything ties in whether it be the socio-economic, the socio-social issues that we, we all face in rural and remote areas, or whether it's just the, the severe infrastructure deficits that we all face. It's, um, you know, it's battling away with decision makers that are, you know, either way, they're three and a half thousand kilometres away, whether they're in Perth or whether they're in Canberra. So trying to tell the story and, and get them interested in here has been the, the challenge of, my 30 years, I suppose. Well, I suppose one of the most interesting things is <clears throat> in, that, in the Hansard, and I presume it's pretty much within, uh, I know this, this is in the Canberra one, and I suppose it's much the same in, in the state, state Hansards, but the word regions, regional and regions are the most commonly referred to area or name in, in the conversation. So, we get plenty of mentions. We don't get much in the way of goods and service and product. Um, so I think a lot of it is there's too much talk about the regions and not enough doing for the regions. Um, well, I'll start off with that. I'm sure Jeff has a view as well. But yes, it certainly seems an attractive topic to discuss. It's just when it comes to funding it, it's not so attractive. It's a lot easier to spend... $10 million on a freeway in Sydney than it is to spend a few million dollars in one of the regions and, you know, realise you're in Cairns. And it's pretty much the same in what we're, we're now defining as Northern Australia. And look, we're not that dissimilar to two hours out of any capital city. They all have similar battles. I would argue that our infrastructure and livability issues are 
significantly greater. But getting getting a um, story that's attractive, and I guess ultimately the weight of voters determine where where the money gets spent the easiest and trying to get investment for the future, which I would suggest is what we're trying to do in Northern Australia, that's a bit hard to sell. Yes. Yeah, I tend to agree, David. Also, it's just little things living in remote areas like the Kimberley, like, um, you know, hospital facilities there, you know, like if you want to make an appointment to see a doctor, you know, you probably look at a minimum of two weeks to make an appointment. So, you know, we are lacking that infrastructure certainly in those areas. And um, even though it is getting better as time goes on, but in the wet season, you know, the town can be isolated at times where, you know, we're restricted with, you know, groceries and food and vegetables coming into town. But having said that, you know, we have elected to live there because I, I believe um, the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages of living in such a beautiful area as the Kimberley of Western Australia. I, don't, I think one of the most disappointing things is, and David, you probably comment on us, back to 2014 with, uh, when Abbott was, uh, did he make it, made, it, made it into the Prime Ministership then, and sort of had a look at the developing Northern Australia, and I think there was a white paper. And we've had different inquiries and different pushes over those um, succeeding years, but <clears throat> as yet, there's been no major infrastructure in, in northern Queensland, and it, it doesn't seem to be. And I don't know what it's going to take to sort of get, get the runs on the, on the board for northern Australia, and especially now after COVID. With both the state governments and the federal government racked up a pretty debt. So one of the most important things, I think, after this is to grow the pie. And I can't see how a $7 million, billion project building a tunnel under the Brisbane River is going to grow the pie. It it's only creates a, a liability thing that it does. It gives commuters a few, few minutes savings. But spending... That's that amount of money to deliver a water project or a major road infrastructure project in the in the regions actually has the potential to create wealth. Um, are you sort of a bit disappointed from a period from 2014 when you first started talking these things in regards to the federal government? There's no delivery in that seven years or not even a side of delivery. Yeah, look, the timelines are so long. It is it is quite dis disappointing. Uh, I guess the Northern Australia in Infrastructure Fund was one of the things that came out of that um, body of work and the, and the white paper. That is starting to gain some traction now, but I th my memory of it was that it was a, with the best intentions, it was set up as a $5 billion fund that would sort of be not freely available, but quite easy to access. And that was that was the sort of the starting point. And then it went through all its due diligence and ended up being almost more of a nightmare to access that than finance from a you know financial institution. And and it, and rightly so, I guess it is taxpayers' money. So it needs needs a lot of due diligence around it. That that's starting to come. Um, come through. We've seen as recently as the last, uh, I was on a webinar with the Federal Minister for Agriculture uh, last week or the week before and and in fairness he's starting to get the story about um, particularly in our region cotton, cotton, cattle and corn is this story we're telling at the moment. I think it's absolutely identical story in North Queensland where you get We've, we've progressed so far with the, with the research on a cotton industry that suddenly dumps a whole heap of high protein feed into Northern Australia. It's something we've never had access to. 
that obviously has a home in the in the pastoral industry or the feedlot industry, the beef industry in general. And these things start to feed off each other. And um, I, I've got a feeling that we're very, very close to seeing some significant investment in the agriculture space. I see pictures of a cotton gin being built in just north of Catherine. That's, that's happening where we're negotiating furiously with the state at the moment to try and get one over the line here. The money's all sitting there. There's just a bit of bureaucracy in the way and we're trying to work our way through that at the moment. So I've, I've got a, you know, I've got a strong feeling that we are entering a phase where regions might actually mean something, and Northern Australia might be on the cusp. But you know, people have been saying this for about 140 <laughs> years, I think. So I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant of being too optimistic, but I think you've got to be an optimist to live in the north anyway. So no, good, good things are coming, and you know, and my, my. Uh, to refer back to what you said before, I think we're, as a nation, we're used to having a really high standard of welfare. Ultimately, you've got to create money to be able to spend money on welfare. So we've got our traditional owner uh, groups here that are really strongly focused on generating economic development as, a, as part of the pathway to improve livability and social outcomes in, in our region of the Kimberley. So I, th I see that uh, given that the traditional owners have control of most of the land in Northern Australia, I think getting the right mindset in there and getting some capability capacity in those organisations is, is really critical to seeing us, you know, take some real steps forward. I think one of the things like the North Australian infrastructure facility, it's, it was a loan, loan facility, um, at a time when interest rates rates are at a historical low, so I think it was basically unnecessary because if you had a decent idea, um, you should be should have been able to access money um, through the normal channels if you, if you had a good business plan and and that. But the other thing, it still what it did, it gives the some kudos to the government as though it's doing something, but it still does it. it doesn't deliver any infrastructure, government infrastructure. It doesn't, doesn't uh, deliver a new dam. It doesn't deliver a new uh, major transport corridor to boost economic growth. It doesn't, doesn't build a irrigation system. Uh, it doesn't provide more services for the people. So I think it's been used as a bit of a uh, fog uh, the saying, well, we're doing and we're interested in, the, in Northern Australia, but we're not, not delivering you anything. So I, I, have, I have my concerns with the North Australian um, infrastructure facility. Uh, it basically, it's got 20 or 30 or more public service units. You've got a couple of heads in there getting $500,000 a year. It, it's just a boondoggle for those sort of things. And it's, and it's still not... Deliver it, it's still not, still, the government is still not delivering infrastructure to us and not even committing money to us. I think that's the problem. Uh, but just to go away from the subject and turn it back to Jeff, I'd just like to, like to touch on your tourist operation and you can tell us what people can expect when they come up to lovely Kununurra and the area and probably best in the dry season between. April and probably September. Yeah, that's a it's um, well this time of the year, like I'm down in Margaret River, but uh, yeah, we're in a situation here as most tour operators throughout Northern Australia. Um, you know, we've got 150 days in the year to make a dollar, and like to give you an idea, from November through to March each year, we do about five percent of our turnover. So you know, we've got to have all this infrastructure in place um, to cater for that peak demand in that June, July, August period, which then just sits idle um, through our wet season, you know, the November to March period. But when you say the best time to come to the Kimberley um, is in the cooler months, but it's also spectacular in the wet season, you know, especially once you get into January, February, uh, when you get the heavy rain, you get the waterfalls flowing. But, you know, we still got to accept the fact that it's very hot and it's very humid and a lot of people just can't handle that sort of climate. 
So, um, but having said that, well, basically, um, we gear ourselves to handle those um, peak months. The big problem we have, of course, is seasonal staff. Um, you know, probably to, to drive one of our tour boats up the river, you're probably looking up, up to three months training. But then we can really only offer that person, you know, probably eight months of a year work. So it's hard to keep that continuity of staff um, into the following season. Just in regards to the wet season, I have, <laughs> sometimes you have some beauties because you get a, a couple of um, tropical storms or, or you get the uh, offshoots of cyclones. So you get some pretty, pretty horrendous falls at time. Would also, uh, because most, most of your visitors, I mean, you still get people flying in and that, but is there a reasonable set percentage or what percentage are people in, of road traffic um, who go for the great great Australian drive, and and in that wet season, uh, is connectivity a bit of a problem in through various states parts coming up from the south of, uh, from in West Australia coming up from the south through the Hilbert and that, and also coming across from the Northern Territory. Uh, is is there a lot of pro problems in regards to road closures and things like that? Well, as, as time goes on, it's getting better every year, like um, especially in the Kimberley region where, you know, certain creeks and a couple of rivers which used to flood and close the roads, you know, for weeks on end. Um, it's, they've all been, you know, new bridges. And to give you an example, like this last season, this gone, we had probably one of our big wet, biggest wets on record. And yet I think the town was probably only isolated for a couple of days because of road closures. So in that regard, things are getting better in our part of the world. Okay, then, look, I'll just share a screen here. This is, this is your... your Triple J tours, and, and that's the uh, downstream side of the main dam. Downstream side, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, basically, our tour goes from Cunnamara to Lake Gargoyle, which is... So you run on that, that, that stretch between the bottom of the dam and the towards the diversion dam. The diversion dam, that's right. Does anyone actually do anything on Lake Argyle? Yeah, there's another two tour operators do boat crews on Lake Argyle itself. Is there a big which we sport? work in very closely with because we do like package tours where oh. they leave in the morning, go and do a cruise on Lake Argyle and come back down the river of us to Kanara. So, yeah. Is water skiing popular or...? Swimming. Water skiing. Well, we have got a ski club in Kununurra, and yeah, it's quite a popular pastime. You know, we've got the uh, perfect venue for water skiers. You know, people so, worry about the crocodiles, but it's freshwater <laughs> crocodiles, which are not generally considered to be dangerous to water skiers. <laughs> Except when they hit them. Yeah, that's probably the biggest problem. <laughs> this, this is one, one of your boats. Can you tell us about roughly where you are or what, what's the sort of surroundings and how ancient the country is? Yeah, well, basically where we are there, once Dog member actually entering into um, the Gorge country, you're going into Carlton Gorge. Um, so basically it's um, it's all um, sedimentary style rock, um, you know, mudstone, siltstone, believed to be laid down out of only period. But where we operate, it is most of the country is totally inaccessible to vehicles. Like the only way you can get there is by boat or possibly helicopter. And the, and the between the main dam and the diversion dam, is that that level kept constant? Is it? From I was speaking to Greg, he's, there's something about uh, some areas are kept a constant um, height. Is that? Yeah, but, well, basically the Lake Kanara, the lower lake, is kept at a constant level, so it wouldn't gravitate out onto the irrigation plain, but. <laughs> The only time we have issues is the last 15 kilometres of the trip before we get to Lake Argyle, where the boats must physically climb 10 metres. So we rely on that flow from the hydroelectric power station to give us enough water to get through. So, like, basically, if a hydro power station shuts down for any more than one hour, we can't do our tour. You can't get right up to the dam? No. Wall. Okay. Okay, so now I understand how that works. <laughs> Yeah, basically, we've got two dams. Lake Argyle keeps the lower dam topped up so water will gravitate out of the plane. Okay. Um, 
obviously one one part of your tour, and that is obviously features the wildlife um, uh, of the of the area. Uh, yep. Maybe you can give us a bit of a rundown. Just because you were there as far back as '85, yep. have you seen a, an improvement in the ecosystem, basically? Uh, and does it does it enhance the wildlife by having this human feature there, or or has it been a detriment? No, look, I'll probably go out a bit of a limb here, but I believe it's possibly you know, one of the few ecosystems in the world which is certainly benefited by the building of the two dams to form Lake Tunnara and Lake Argyle. Like, for example, in um, 1959, before the dams were built, they did a count of bird species. They came up with 112 species. Two years ago, they did a similar count, 172 species. So you got an additional 60 species of bird have moved into the area because of the permanent water. You know, your aquatic life, you have 26 species of fish, your crocodiles, your crustaceans. You know, their population has probably increased 10,000 fold because of the increased volume of permanent water. And that's it's the beauty of this ecosystem is that we don't have, you know, any introduced fish, you know, like European carp or trout or any of that sort of stuff. We're all native species. But it's not, not actually that you're adding more water to the system. It's actually that you're controlling the system so that right. there's, there's a constant flow in the river all year round, I presume. And because our, our, our river systems in northern Australia are, are basically rush and bust and dust. So during the wet season, uh, you, you get, of course, you get all your rain. The rivers rage for a few months. And they you know, gradually trickle down, and then for even you know three or four months, heading you know uh, as into the dry season, it's almost they're almost bone dry. So I don't well, see that's how right. that's basically, basically what we're doing here, Bill, is you know we're holding back these wet season floods in Lake Argyle, and then releasing them out to sea over the following dry season. So what was once a dry riverbed for you know probably six months of the year, you now got permanent flood water. So, you know, the, the whole ecology has changed completely. And as I say, it's, it's changed for better because it, uh, yeah, it can certainly support more wildlife. That, that's what I'm sort of suggesting. Humans, humans can enhance the environment, whereas the general attitude for most, most environmentalists, if you say, I want to put a dam up on the, up here, say, on the Flinders River or divert part of the river and into a holding pool, and things like that, they go nuts. You know, you're destroying the, the ecology and all that. But like I say, I mean, I, I, I think a, a river that goes from rush to dust isn't all that isn't all that great for the overall environment. If if we control the water flow year round, so there's permanent water all the way along that water course, you would think it have to do be better. And you think the people who care about the environment might even support that but they they're almost well their automatic reaction to any plan with the store divert or distribute water is oh no you can't have that yeah I, I think in our case so we're pretty fortunate in the fact that you know lake argo is um the biggest reservoir in australia hence we do have this huge and we shouldn't call it a surplus of water, but a huge supply of water. And I think you mentioned earlier on, like there's probably like a realistic figure would be ten percent of the available water being used for irrigation. And yeah, you know, I suppose you can substantiate that. But I think the two main irrigation channels would probably draw uh, ten cumex, uh, ten thousand liters a second, whereas we're putting on average forty to fifty thousand liters a second straight out into the ocean. So we've got this huge reserve of water. And of course, we need that amount of water to produce hydroelectric power. But the other thing is too, the dam, Lake Argyle, <clears throat> how much is it really, in the worst case, like in drought or something like that, how, how far has the Lake Argyle actually dropped? A couple of metres or 10 oh, metres? No, or... like last year, it got to it's probably one of its lowest ever levels. Um, you know, I suppose everyone talks Sydney Harbours, but... It would have got down below four Sydney harbours. Um, at the moment, I haven't got the exact figures in front of me, but I'd say it'd be probably um, sitting around 12, 14 Sydney harbours. The highest it ever got 
2011, we got to about 42 Sydney Arbors. So, yeah, huge amount of water. I suppose to put it in some twisted terms, I think at the moment there's about um, 7,000 gigalitres of water. You know, per annual consumption is about 450 gigalitres. So, yeah, you know, be close on 20 years supply for Perth sitting in the lake at the moment. That's if we didn't have evaporation, of course. I think, I think just off the top of my head, the, when it was built, stage one, um, I think it aimed at 500, I mean, 5,200 odd uh, gigalitres, which was 11, 11 Sydney harbours. And then in 2009, there was not, was an extension or a, an additional six metres of weir wall put on. And that got it up to 10,000 yeah, 10, gigalitres, 20, 20, 21. Yeah, over 10,000 gigalitres. That, that, they put a six metre plug on the spillway in 1996, which basically doubled the holding capacity of Lake Argyle. Yeah. So, so we've, we've, had, we've, had, uh, we've had the original project, then we've had that stage. <clears throat> and... Now, I'll we'll probably go over to David and you can tell us about the, the stages in the agriculture. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah, and thanks, Jeff. That's, that's good. I'm, I'm not good on specific numbers. I'm sort of general, more general on the information. But I think your point about using some of the natural assets in Northern Australia, you know, as you said, well, Jeff said, you know, less than 10% of this water is actually being diverted for irrigation. And... I'm not sure that I see irrigation as a waste of water. It's actually a good productive use. So I think the, most of the problems with natural resources is when you when you get so over committed to them and you you know you're just removing too much of them. Or we get rainfall that keeps filling that dam up. It's a pretty it's a pretty um, variable rainfall in our area. We don't get those afternoon build up showers every day. We're dependent on weather systems rolling through and and they will or won't bring rain to us. So, you know, utilising some of the resources of Northern Australia, some of that water, I don't think that it's going to impact on the environment. In fact, it's really interesting, isn't it? If you, as you made the point, Bill, if you, we're always dealing with decision makers in the South. Now, if you had rivers doing what they do in the north in the south they'd be all hell break loose because they'd be ripping the banks apart and there'd be silt going down the rivers and and it'd be the worst ecological disaster ever if the rivers down there behave like they naturally do up here so that's that's just one of you know western australia is renowned for its loss of rainfall over the last 20 years it's probably one of the most studied and significant um, climate change areas uh, in, in the world. And these are the people that are making decisions on our behalf. Now, we live in an in a environment where the best science is saying that climate change will have little or no impact on total rainfall. There's some debate about whether there might be a few more severe events. But we've got that water supply. At the end of the day, I think we can run out of fuel, we can run out of lots of things, but we can't run out of water. So utilising some of the huge water resources we have in Northern Australia makes a whole lot of sense to me. And again, you know, I don't see that we have to impact on that natural balance. In fact, if anything, we can utilise that water smart in a smart way and, and potentially enhance the the, um, the environmental benefits. What Jeff didn't point out, which is we've got quite a few Ramsar listed wetlands up here. Now that's purely because we have control or some control over the, the huge storms that happen in the wet season. So, you know, why development has to be a negative to the environment, it's got me beat. I think it can be, can be a positive if it's done well. I think I, said, I certainly agree with that, though. I think one of the main things people don't seem to realise is that water is the most sustainable thing that we've got. I mean, only only problem we got is its delivery system, its natural delivery system, is is erratic, 
<laughs> and, uh, in, in, and not very dependable. Uh, but it doesn't matter. The rain will fall somewhere. It will flow somewhere. And the thing is, even if you uh, capture it, store it, uh, divert it, and distribute it, it doesn't disappear. It, it, all right, in, in the flow down the river and take off for the irrigation system, you'll have evaporation, and that's one of the just natural sort of things that occur. But the evaporation is going up, and that's going to ma help make the next lot of rainfall somewhere else. But the water that's pumped up and doesn't get lost to evaporation, if, if you're, you're irrigating areas within the catchment area, um, the water's going to soak through the ground, go down to a level, and then all naturally find its way back to the water course and go out, or stored in an artesian, uh, underground artesian basin sort of thing. So we, ne we never lose water. It's not as though we, we use it and lose it. It's, it's something that goes or it comes around and goes around sort of thing. And it's really an onus on us to make good use of it and also enhance our environment and the world we live in with it. Absolutely agree. And I think that's one of the joys of being a, a farmer is that you get to use the, the um, what nature gives to you and you use it responsibly because your, your livelihood depends on it. And I think it's one of the most rewarding things to be able to see a positive benefit out of, out of that action. Just touching on the farming there, can you give us a bit of an overview of uh, the Wood River project and it sort of how it started off in, in the agricultural and what it was involved in? And you know, because I think they tried bananas there, sugar cane, uh, different things, and then it's progressed to uh, what's it progressed to now and what's what's the future as far as it's the types of crops that it's looking at. Yeah, look, so one of the, you know, I don't think it's any secret if we called the Ord River Scheme the white elephant. Now, that's that's pretty common around most people who are slightly informed, but maybe not very well informed. So when it was first built, it was seen that rice and co or cotton and rice and those sort of crops were going to be the way to go. They've always been looking for a scale um, crop that, would underpin all the specialty things. One of the big problems we have here is we can pretty much grow anything that doesn't require a chill. So we've got so many options. When something doesn't work, we swap out of it and go into another crop. And I think a lot of people see that as failure. I actually see that as good business sense when something's not making money or not in demand, you grow something that's in demand. So most, this valley's grown melons, um, you know, all the different melons and pumpkin crops. That's really underpinned most of the wealth that's been generated in the Ord. And that's been happening since the early eighties. So after that rice and cotton was a bit of a disaster back then because we didn't have the technology and knowledge we have now. Um, so then melons took over and that's made quite a few of those farmers, you know, that's allowed them to get on and do their, their business. And, and then we've moved into sugarcane. This gets me onto another topic, but we had a sugarcane industry back in the 90s and early 2000s. That industry was, again, based on getting it up and running and CSR built the the plant and and I think that was probably getting back to funding options I think that was or I'm pretty sure that was based on an R&D uh, tax offset it was I think it was running at 150 percent back then so these are the sort of tricks you can use to get the private sector to you know basically fund um, a lot of the infrastructure we need but that sugarcane industry was built on the premise that we were going to expand the ore irrigation scheme out over a large area now for whatever reason again that didn't happen and the sugar industry for several reasons but largely because it couldn't get to scale that wound down and at exactly the same time there was a really strong push on managed investment schemes and someone had the great idea that sandalwood would be the um, saviour of the Ord. So about half of the Ord Valley was either leased to or purchased by these sandalwood companies. 
and we saw this huge boom in in forestry. There was still the base crop still being grown, the melons, the well beans, um, fresh beans, um, chickpeas, bolotti beans, a little bit of corn, but the, it was really the sandalwood that was then going to be the scale crop. Now that's that's in an interesting phase at the moment after the MIS schemes all converted over to different entities and and we've still got sandalwood being harvested but what's happened since then um, ha has been the huge gains in technology and cotton and that's been a, a major R&D project for the last five or six years here and we've got I think about 2,000 hectares of cotton going in next year and that's really on the basis of getting to know how to how to grow the crop in these conditions and we're waiting on a gin so cotton is the you know the big hope at the moment I think with it, there's been so much R&D done on it that we've got a high level of confidence that, that that crop now is manageable in the north whether it be here whether it be in the territory or over in Queensland I think we've got the tools and we will keep developing the tools to make that crop work for us. It's such a such a beautiful crop to grow in the north. So good for the for the ground. And um, so yeah, we've also you know over the last four or five years we've had a huge corn industry in in the Ord. It's it's a great crop to grow. The only problem is you don't make much money out of it. So you can only do that for so long. Um, it's a really rewarding, high yielding, grows fantastic, um, in, fantastically in the tropics. And most of that goes to uh, South Korea. We've got a customer over there, goes into the human food supply chain. And then the, the great thing about it is that the rest of it goes into the pastoral industry where pastoralists are now I guess on the back of some good beef prices, but also recognising that cattle, you know, in the north, they want to live for six months of the year and then they spend the next six months of the year trying to die. So you've got to add some feed to them to keep them alive and keep them performing. And that's, that's what's happening in the pastoral industry around us. And um, that's, been a, that's been a great outcome of having a good feed source for them but we need we need the cotton we need the protein out of the seed and that's the really valuable thing to the pastoral industry um, if it's here it just automatically takes about two hundred dollars a ton off the freight cost so we can really generate the the cost the cost benefit on the cotton industry actually shows a bigger benefit from the seed through the pastoral industry and the local economy than it does to the growers who generally are growing it for the lint, for the cotton lint. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's got some huge upside right across the north of Australia. Well, with the cotton, uh, we have a grower down in the Burdekin, uh, which is south of Townsville, who ha has had great success there. And at the moment, there's talk uh, further out west uh, basically along that Townsville Mount Isa corridor uh, for cotton. And also uh, I know there is a current study, uh, economic study on uh, being a cotton bin for somewhere out, out west in Queensland. So it is, seems to be a bit of, bit of the favourable talk at the, at the moment and hopefully uh, they all get off the ground. But like I say, it's, it's regional Australia and especially northern Australia has the potential to deliver wealth to the, to the Commonwealth, to the whole nation. And it's not, the pie is not going to grow by a tunnel in Sydney or a tunnel in Brisbane or a, or a, or a Olympic stadium in Brisbane. It's not going to grow the pie for Australia that we desperately need. It's got to come from the regions, so I don't know what it's going to take. Do we need to direct, you know, sort of close Canberra down and move move the whole parliament up into the north and say, well, you've got to stay here until you until you actually put some money, and then you, then you can go back south or something. But but it but it's still it's it really is like flogging a leg of a horse with those people down south. 
Look, I think we, um, and it's probably not original, but we suffer a huge disease here and it's called aeronautical amnesia. So they fly up here and learn everything. And by the time they've flown back to Perth, they've forgotten everything they saw. <laughs> and, it, and it applies in Canberra as well. It's really difficult because so much of their focus is on the, on the higher populated and developed areas of the country. So, yeah, it's a really tricky one. It's, look, it's also, as Jeff said, it's really hard. It's really hard living up here and we choose it and love the challenge. But there's probably some tricks to, um, to help people live up here. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit flippant, but I don't even know why we pay income tax up here. The cost of living is so high. If they just gave us back our income tax to offset some of the cost of living, I mean, you need to motivate people to be here. It's, it's, you also, I believe you actually need to open it up to people who want to live here. We spend a lot of effort trying to drag people up here to work for us. I think we could probably change a few rules. We have some great, you know, our town in particular has a, is one of the, I don't know, I'd argue it's one of the most um, ethnically diverse towns in Australia. And it's because people have come here as backpackers or come here from foreign families, whether it be the, the Americans who came out to grow cotton or the Germans who, are, who came out here to farm. And then all the backpackers that have worked here over the years and chosen to make it home. It's a, it's a really exciting dynamic having those different cultures, although they'd all call themselves Australian now. But, you know, we should be letting people live here if they want to live here rather than trying to drag people out of the South where... They're probably pretty comfortable and happy on the whole. Just as a matter of instance, you've got 460 hectares, um, which is a reasonable size plot. Could, could say, a family business on much lesser land uh, who would mainly focus on like market gardens or something like that, you know, that sort of area, could they make a go of it up there? Yes. So we've got around this year, we've got about 20, uh, 23 or 4,000 hectares in, in production in the ord. We've got the first stage of 15 and then the next block, which um, Kimberley Agriculture have, that's another seven and, and a bit. So about 22,000 hectares. The uh, more than 50% of the gross income of the valley will be coming off less than a thousand hectares and that's the horticulture so i'm nearly getting too old for it but if you want to come here and work hard and do horticulture there's you can make money that's that's how i got four kids through boarding school is on horticulture um so yes you, you don't have to have hundreds and hundreds of hectares and this and Look, there's actually opportunities. It's pretty hard to buy land here because the people who own it want to hold on to it. They know what you know, how good this place can be. But there are some good opportunities to lease land. I don't own any land. I lease all my land, and that's what we've done for the last 25 years. Um, so there's plenty. There's still plenty of opportunity here for people who want to have a go. Yeah. And, and Jeff. How, how do you find the community in Kananara? Is it, is it a is it a real mix 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 lot um, locally? Um, no, no. Look, it, it's um, or are they very? It's very, it's, very, it's very itinerant. Like for example, like a big um, employer of a, is the government departments, you know, both state and federal, and most of those people are there just for a three year term and they move on. So um, you know, have this continually changing population, you know, as a new staff come down, like every year we probably pick up, you know, 15, 20 new school teachers. Um, you know, the police in town, like we've got a town of um, about 6,000 people. I think we've got over 40 policemen stationed there, you know, so there's, they're always turning over every three years. So it's um, a very interesting and very enjoyable town to live in. I suppose the other problem too is because there's, You've got to send kids away for their later schooling and that. There's a good proportion of those that don't come back. So it's probably hard to get an established um, permanent base if you, of population that are uh, going to go to be there from birth to death sort of thing. 
and generational. Um, how, how many families actually sort of have, or you know, percentage of the population have a grandfather, uh, father and children in the, in the, still in the same area? Or, or, or is, it, or is that very rare? Well, it's possibly the case with a few of the Indigenous families, but there's very few um, European white people who've got grandparents living down. I know, as Dave will, we're in a few of the older farming families up there have been there since the dates of you know, the 1960s, but uh, very few and far between. But I think Dave and I probably regard as old timers in the town. We've been there you know, 30, 35 <laughs> years, so. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, Jeff. Um, it is one of the tricky things, you know, at a shire level, and again, you know, it's contracts, a lot of it, you're turning over 30% of your staff as a minimum every year. So so there is that turnover. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a good base that has been here for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, but um, it is one of the dynamics of living in a in a regional area. Look, that's not particularly different to towns that are two or three hours outside of capital cities in the south. So we're not unique. And again, that gets back to the, the regional part of it is how do we how do we keep people in the regions and what do we got to do to allow businesses to grow in the regions? What do we what do we what sort of incentives or motivation can we provide other than the obvious ones of living in the best part of the country which is outside of the city and i think one of the problems we're facing in regional western australia is like the current labor government looks like they're going to push through this uh, one person one vote which will certainly have a bad impact on regional centers throughout the state how, well how's how's that regard like to, well, well like the way, the way in a lower house in a lower house seat um like in, in queensland we used to under well, from 1949 to 1989, we had the malapportionment system where a seat out of, out of, out of a rural area uh, had about 5,000 voters, a bit closer in, had about 10,000. And then if you're in the major cities like uh, Brisbane, uh, Rockhampton, Cairns, Townsville, you had up to 15,000 uh, voters. Uh, now well, we've, got, we've got one vote, uh, one vote, one value system back to that. Uh, yeah, but, that's they what do have, they, but, but they do have an allowance, uh, what's called a large, large electorate allowance. It's basically for the bigger, bigger uh, areas like uh, the seat of Cook, Traeger, Warrigo and Gregory. Uh, they actually allow that number to be around a lower than what the um, normal quota quota is. is. Is that what you currently have for the Kimberleys? Like you don't have to have the same sort of number of voters as, as down in uh, a metropolitan seat. That, that's what it is yeah. currently, but that's what the government proposed to change. So, like so one vote, like, like my one vote in Kanara would be equivalent to one vote of the person living in the city of Perth. So how many seats will you lose in regional Australia, uh, Western Australia? I can tell you offhand, yeah, Bill. But Dave, could you give us a number there? Oh, look, I'm, I'm not quite sure, Jeff, whether that's the way it's going to work. We'll still keep our local numbers. So we're, Queensland's only got one house. We've got two. Our, our upper house was always um, represented regions, and they've taken that away from us. So now it's just a number of people that sit in the upper house or the house of review. So it's really put a workload onto the local members and, and to the local governments who, you know, ultimately don't have much power or say. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, your local members suddenly got a hell of a workload because you, she, she, in our case, is not going to have any particular support in the upper house to, um, to argue, fight, whatever, represent those regional communities. But I don't think at this stage, this, I don't think we're going to lose our um, regional seats as such. It's just the changes in the upper house. So, yeah. you know... Yeah, so it, it will be a change and it will be less specific representation and more work for our local members to do and our, and our local governments to represent, you know, local regional populations. So, so your up house is going over the same way as New South Wales where it's just one big pool and, yeah. like, 
basically everyone elected to the upper house could actually be people who just live in Sydney. You know, they actually yes. not, whereas at least in Victoria, they do divide it up into eight areas overall. Um, I think you've got uh, three, three provinces running along the Murray River, and then you've got basically five centres gathered around Melbourne. Uh, so you are, those areas are voting for about four or maybe five people in the upper house in each of those each of those blocks. But if it's just one big pool, well, you, chances are everyone elected to the upper house would just be people from Perth, have nothing to do with the regions, have no empathy for them, and therefore you will get nothing out of them because they have no empathy or connection to regional West Australia. And that's the same that we've got here. There is no upper house. There is no uh, sort of representation a representation from regional areas or connect we just depend on our local members in in the lower house so it's <laughs> it's not a good situation for you coming up uh, you're probably right i'm really interested though because you know queensland as you pointed out um you could say had the benefit of all those years of um you know we know who he was joe no 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 uh, a... actually, see this is where yeah, a lot but... of people don't do their research Right. Actually, it actually came in, the, uh, the Mel apportionment came in in 1949 with the Hanlon yep. Labor, go Labor government. Because what was happening, they were losing um, clout in the regional areas because of the mechanisation, uh, the drop off in shearing. Their vote, yep. voting in the regions was dropping off. So they're the ones who actually introduced this Mel apportionment. It's just that yep. Joe perfected it. <laughs> so, he, so, he, all right. So, I'm oh, the artist at it. Well, no, it's I'm a really it, yeah, I'm really interested to hear that. But, but the same, the, the point was, or my question was going to be to you, Bill, was uh, we're probably, I think, what we're seeing is still that, you know, if you go west of the divide, Queensland, you know, taking out a bit of um, mining it's probably suffering the same regional impacts or lack of regional growth that, that the rest of us. So all those years of having that focus on the regions, do you think it's delivered much to the regions in Queensland? I think if you go back to Joe's days, um, in the 80s and that, that's when, that's when Cairns got an international airport. That's when we got the Burdick and Dan built. That's when we got the Galilee Basin opened up. And that was basically because in the state parliament, more, though I think at those days, I think there was only, when Joe started, there was only 72 two seats in the lower house altogether. And 42 seats were in regional Queensland. And I'm talking about, you know, 250 kilometres out, out away from Brisbane. 40, now, you had 42 seats by rural people. It means they had a lot of say, and that's why the regions did so well during that malapportionment thing. But then when we went back to one man, uh, one vote, one value, we've now got the situation where regional Queensland only has 20 seats and the median area around Brisbane, Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, there's 73 seats. And that's the same thing for Sydney. They've got 73 seats in that Wollongong, Newcastle, Sydney are present. Only 20 seats in the in the rest of the state. Um, and then, if you look, it's even worse. East, uh, west of the divide, they've only actually got eight seats west of the divide in regional in regional New South Wales. So that's one of the big problems: is lack of representation of regional people in their state parliament. And I, and, and I don't know how. Well, I do know how we address it. We, we create new states on, as, as provided under the Constitution. The Constitution, there's a whole chapter in there, Chapter 6, allows for the creation of new states. But unfortunately, the initiation of that, that um, those uh, for the new state comes of the state parliament. And they don't like giving up anything. So that's that's a bit of the issue. Um, if I just, so go, just... Yeah, go on. Yeah, just um, that was a very, when we're working on the Northern Australia white paper, that was a very, very short discussion, that one. But I think we all acknowledge that that was one way to do it. But uh, it was a very short discussion because the, the reality is that it can't happen. We're struggling to deal with the, 
the juris across jurisdictional matters here. We need to get water over the border into the territory. We need to get workers backwards and forwards over, you know, essential workers, and that's hard enough, let alone going any further. Yeah. Uh, well, we can have, I, can, I can give you some pointers on separate states anyway. But uh, if we just go back to the dam itself, um, I'll just show, share a screen. Dun, dun, dun. Now this this is the diversion dam. This is the this was the first one built in the sixties. That right? Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. And 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 that's and that's basically the centre that drives the irrigation. The flow out of that. Is no, basically yep, so all that dam does it holds back the water in Lake Tanara, which is the lake behind it. Now that water and simplifying is basically higher than the. The plane and the water just gravitates from the lake out onto the plane. So the bulk okay. of the water so, gravitates from the lake. So we've got, um, I think we've got some real green credentials here and it pains me a little bit, but we need to probably do some capturing some of that. We've got hydro delivered, we've got hydro generated up at the top dam, the one we can't see. Yep. So yep. the whole region runs on hydroelectricity. Okay. Yep, so on the bottom of the screen there's a um hang on no you can see the tower there just yes. up, up street yep so that's the hydro intake so the whole region or the east kimberley runs on hydro then we gravity feed water out to grow our crops it's a darn good start if you wanted to, to start tallying up your green credits don't you think <laughs> And, and this, this, this is some of your land that's irrigated. Yeah, so you're probably looking at mostly um, mango trees there. There's quite a few. Uh, there's a couple of big growers, but some smaller growers with mango trees as well. Yep. So does the individual farmer uh, take water out of the system? Like, say, say this person who's living here, does he just have a pump over here and sucks water on? Or, or how is it delivered? So, yeah, so there's a there's a channel system that will deliver to most of those properties, but some of them do have a license to pump out of the out of the um, river there where you were. So a bit of a bit of both there. The commercial farms, that big shed and all around it, that will not have access to the river. But there's there's a whole heap of um, eight to twelve hectare blocks along the river, and some of them have their own. So in WA, we don't have water rights here. We we um, have licenses and the irrigation cooperative I chair holds the license for Ord stage one. So we hold a 335 gigalitre license for about 65 different entities. And that's, that's the way. And then we have the responsibility to operate and maintain the system. That's the co-op co -op I have. We have another co-op that is a mutual cooperative, doesn't trade and it owns the system except for the main supply channel, which the state owns. So that's how the water okay, Jeff, works so really got, quickly. A little, little, little bit over there, but we'll just push on for a little bit. Um, we could just talk about the future development and what they mean. And basically, to make them come to fruition, what sort of population sort of increase do you need to make it all work? Look, most farming these days to make it work under the under the um, the the current economics, you don't want too many people there. But so the Goomig area that you've got marked there, that's the area that's developed now. The white the white box, it's, it says seven thousand four hundred hectares. Looking at um, the Knox area is the next one that could well get a development lease signed on it any day now. And that's, that's the key one to get us going with the cotton industry. We really need to get that extra bit of capacity just to make it um, scale, scalable. And then the pink areas. Um, I was fortunate, yeah, I was fortunate enough to work, in, work for the Northern Territory on, on releasing that parcel as well. And that's um, been through an expressions of interest or requests for proposals. Um, it's nothing signed off yet, but there's proponents that are talking to the territory about that as well. Maybe not 
it's, it might be a bit deceptive. I don't see that that will be all irrigation, but there'll be a there'll be a portion of irrigation potentially in there, as long as we can work out how to legally get water over that that territory uh, West Australian line. They're really tricky things to negotiate those lines on that. It's called making them pay for it and getting rid of it. <laughs> oh, look, <laughs> that's no, all, what well, they wanted to do is buy it. Yeah, well, look, you've got to be fair to them. Most of the water in Lake Argyle comes out of the territory, so we've actually stolen it off them. But if we can sell it back to them, that's a good result. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> just need, but, need but, a few snake oil salesmen. But as a, as a community, we want to see that develop because that just adds, you know, it adds to the Northern Australia picture. It adds a lot more resilience into our our, our communities, whether it be Kununurra or Wyndham. So we're, you know, as a community, we're really, really keen to see some higher value production out of out of that area. And of course, we've got, dare I mention, Project Sea Dragon, which you've got a bit of, you've got a bit of um, exposure to with sea farms in Queensland. So that's sitting in that pink space or near that pink space as well. And that's, you know, that's, They've done some work this year and they're planning to do more work next year. So, so really, overall, I mean, I can see the Institute, of, the Australian Institute or whatever it is, and their paper in 2017, I can see their point in regards to uh, as yet Lord River project hasn't delivered you know, greatness, if you know what I mean. But thank heavens, dams will last two Two or three hundred years, <laughs> so they've got plenty of time. It's not like a desalination plant lasts twenty years and you've got to rebuild it. So yes. you, you still got plenty of time to make make it you know, reach its potential. And just oh, just one other thing, you did touch on about um, sort of dragging people there, get people who want to come. Do you think maybe one of our um, immigration programs could be something like you know, to the people who live in harsh environments like you know, Southeast Asia where it's hot and humid and stuff like that and uh, want to change in change in uh, venue and, and uh, scenic, scenery um, do you think we may be in regards to say like having um, market gardens and things like that do you, do you think there's a possibility you could open up small lots and that to uh, that sort of um, group of people that might, might might be the basis of a permanent population? Yeah, look, I think so. Um, if you look around Darwin, Darwin's got a huge horticultural area and that's, I would say, might be fair to say, is predominantly um, of the Southeast Asian operators. The order's probably a little bit trickier. It's not quite as kind a climate. It's... Um, a bit harsh each end of the year, but absolutely, that's we've got plenty of um, various Southeast Asian communities in our in our community now, and they are really good contributors. So I'm really keen to see it. To that extent, our Chamber of Commerce is working on a Dharma designated area migration arrangement at the moment, just to see if we can make some better pathways for people who come here and we want to keep and they want to stay here to see if we can get them a better pathway into, into um, residency and citizenship. I think it's really important. Just back and quickly on this. Growing yeah, our economy. On, oh, absolutely. And that's where we're at with the cotton industry. The, the, go back to the Australia Institute. So maybe their numbers were based on the, the cost of developing all the infrastructure for the tiny little bit of farming that was going on. But we have got a town of about 7,000 people. We've got schools, hospitals, all the other amenities that you would have in a, a regional centre. I'm not sure that the benefits of having those in a remote area were ever taken into, into account, but we've certainly been operating the orders of pilot farm for the last 50 years, and we're hoping we can move beyond that and get it up to what it was always envisaged to be, which was sort of 50, 60,000 hectares. And, and we're very close to having that pathway open to us at the moment. So I think it's an exciting future. I think we also got to remember too, Bill, that we look, and fair enough, it's 1960 dollars, but the total cost to build both these dams and the associated infrastructure was $42 million. Yeah, which in that regard, 
people can refer to it as the Great White Elephant, but it's an asset to the nation just having that much water there. Yeah, well, we'd, we'd just like to get some assets in North Queensland too, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez, geez, I don't, I don't know. Cairns, Townsville, Mackay—they're not too yeah, bad towns, but, to start yeah. with. <laughs> oh, but we'd like the infrastructure to go with, for, go there for the people. Um, we're yeah. still operating a goat track. The national highway is still a goat track. But uh, just yeah, one we've, last we've, thing. we've still got one way bridges through the Kimberley. <laughs> you, you take your life into your hands when you yes. drive Highway One over here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just just to wind up, I just want to um, talk about uh, last week on I had a professor Richard uh, Eckhart. Uh, he's from the University of Melbourne and he's to do with a uh, climate change uh, partnership with the Victorian government. And after we did he was talking about carbon uh, <clears throat> soil carbon and uh, carbon credits, and basically, we're basically there's a big danger of, of farmers getting involved in selling selling the carbon because uh, might get a a, uh, a sugar hit initially, but they've got a lifetime liability. But after the show, we were just talking, and the and two things came up. And I don't know why he knows anything about it because a he's a South African by birth, and he bloody lives in Melbourne, but. He got on to the topic of water, and the first thing he pointed out, you know, we're, we're pathetic in regards to water projects in this country and have been for the last 30 years. And he pointed out, you, you, in the last century, you had had the West Australian government, or it was colonial government, build the infrastructure for the Kalgoorlie pipeline, build two dams, and that, and that's still working today. Kalgoorlie is still delivering for the state today. And he says it's sort of amazing that you know, there was visionaries in those days. And we've had a couple of other bits of visionary infrastructure. And he did point to the Snowy Hydro and to the Ord River. And the interesting thing that came out of that after, after the event conversation was he was suggesting that there's a good opportunity in the new economy of carbon and decarbonisation, the fact that you've got water and if you can just release it, you know, get your surplus and release it on land and grow anything, just grass or whatever, what you're adding to your economy and by putting that carbon into the soil, it's got, can be huge potential, you know, for the nation as carbon credits become necessary and all those sort of things. So it was quite interesting, you, you pointed out two things. Even if you just got, got the water out on the land and grew nothing but natural grass, you, it's a major benefit. And yes, you lose water from evaporation, but you still the water still sinks into the ground. It still flows back into the river system somewhere along the line. Uh, so it was an overly great loss. And plus evaporation, it's got to rain somewhere else. The other thing you, you pointed out is, well, maybe it's time I thought of that pumping your surplus water down to Perth or something or Kalgoorlie. But anyway, their conversations were a different time. But I, I did notice <laughs> someone in Kalgoorlie come up with that point and it, and I think it was Ernie Bridge pushed it years ago. And I think Colin Barnett got crucified for it. Um you think there's yeah, but, but Bill, can, I'll, I'll can, can you there, afford to take water out of the system and deliver it south? Yeah, look I think we've got to be realistic here though. Like the the best pump in the world is not going to make a dent on Lake Argyle. But look, the studies have been done on that. And for water for Perth, uh, the big killer is the energy required to pump the water 3,000 kilometres to Perth. And the latest studies are showing that that energy is better used in desalination, you know, as, yep. as they're using now. Right. So we can flow the water out, out the river, around the coast, down to Perth, and they can take the salt out of it, and that's the best option for them. That's right. <laughs> okay, okay then. Um, I think I think we're talking carbon credits. This, I'll throw something else in here. If the powers that be could stop the uh, the fires in the Kimberley, which are you know lit by vandals, like we're losing seventy percent of our Kimberley each year to wildfire. If you could stop those fires lit by vandals, that would do more to um, for carbon credits than anything else we've been talking about today. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, gentlemen. Look, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate the time you're given tonight. Um, I do intend to have um, Professor Eckhart back in the new year have a, have a conversation on this. So whether you join us or, or he's got got someone else in mind, but uh, it'd be an interesting discussion. Um, and I also got to have a few few other people on who are talking about the next economy, which uh, which renewables, hydrogen, carbon credits, sequestration, all those sort of things. So you never know, one of these topics might come to your hometown. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Thanks, Bill. If, you, if you just stay on, stay there for a sec, I'll just wind up the show and uh, <laughs> quick touch it. If you have enjoyed tonight's show, please like, share and subscribe to our Facebook page. And also you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join us again for the next episode, 30, 34, uh, and hopefully I'll be dealing with more on the next economy. Good night.